For a while now, I have received several questions that cannot just be answered only as a comment, but at the same time do not justify a full video, so I have collected a few of them and decided to create this series that I titled Nuclear Weapons Q&A. First of all, thanks for all the questions, comments and engagement in general. And please feel free to use the comment section to add your own questions for future videos of this series. I cannot guarantee to be able to answer all of them, but I will try. Marcelaco writes, Your videos got my 10-year-old son, Daniel, hooked to watching videos of nuclear tests and asking many questions. One thing that he noticed was that the explosions appeared to dim and then glow again. I am a physicist and I can answer some of his questions, but this one I really don't know the answer. Why do explosions glow twice? Daniel is right. If you pay close attention, in the early moments of a nuclear explosion you will see that after the initial flash, the fireball dims and then glows brighter again. The relevant physical concept behind this phenomenon is called the Stefan Boltzmann law which describes the amount of light radiated by an object in terms of its temperature. The intensity is what our eyes and devices interpret as brightness. Since this light intensity is proportional to the temperature to the fourth power, any change in temperature drastically affects the brightness of an object. Back to our nuclear explosion, the nuclear chain reaction releases a vast amount of energy increasing the temperature to several tenths of million degrees. This produces the initial flash of mostly high-energy photons, lasting a fraction of a second. As the fireball expands, it slows down and the temperature drops. The Stefan Boltzmann law tells us that the fireball will get steadily dimmer. But it gets opaque faster than expected when the temperature drops to 300,000 degrees Celsius. Up to this point, fireball and shockwave move together. At this temperature, they move at a speed close to the local speed of sound and the shockwave detaches in front of the fireball and it begins to move ahead. This is called hydrodynamic separation. The air in front of the shockwave is at 8000 degrees Celsius and at this temperature the air is opaque to visible light. Since from the distance we can only see the outermost layer of the explosion, the still very hot fireball gets hidden behind the cooler shock front. This is why the brightness drops so drastically after the first flash. As the concentric fireball and shock wave continue to expand, the temperature keeps falling, and after a few milliseconds, the air at the shock wave front becomes transparent to visible light and from the distance we get to see again the hot and glowing interior of the fireball. This is why it appears that the explosion glows for a second time. It has been glowing continuously all the time, but for a few milliseconds the cooler shockwave hides the hot interior. This gives the appearance of a double pulse of light. This second pulse can last a few seconds. Thanks Marslako for sharing and I hope that Daniel keeps asking you great questions. Speck Messer writes, has anybody seen an explanation of by how much the plutonium core was compressed in the Trinity or Nagasaki explosions? Would the compression of the core during detonation be visible to the naked eye? This question I really liked because I had never wondered this before. And I have to be honest, it really took me a long time to figure out the answer. In several videos I have mentioned that the gadget detonated at the Trinity test as well as Fatman, the bomb drop on Nagasaki, used the implosion design, in which instead of smashing two subcritical amounts of nuclear material, the bomb's core is compressed by high explosives. The plutonium core in those bombs had a diameter close to 92 mm, about the size of a softball. The core of a bit over 6 kg of plutonium was compressed to increase its density, and with this, the mass needed to reach criticality would drop below the 6 kg of the core and the nuclear chain reaction could start. I showed all the math behind this idea in the video about critical mass. The question that Speck Messer explicitly asked was would the compression of the core during detonation be visible to the naked eye, which I interpret as a way to say whether or not the compression would be noticeable. A quick search leads to the excellent nuclear weapons archive maintained by Kari Sublet, which I highly recommend. 
Here we find that the convergent shock wave of an implosion can compress solid uranium or plutonium by a factor of 2 to 3. But it's unclear to me whether this refers to the core's diameter or density. If the plutonium core is compressed until reaching 2 to 3 times its diameter, then the plutonium core goes from a softball to a ping pong ball. But if the compression factor refers to the density, then the plutonium core goes from a softball to a tennis ball. So which one is it? I wanted to find a scientific publication reporting this value. After a few hours of extensive search, I found this article published over 15 years ago titled Modeling the Effects of the Trinity Test, which includes lots of detailed information, but mostly about the radiochemistry of the test. Important for us, there is a table that includes the core compression factor to be 2.5, possibly somewhat less. But once again, it is unclear if this compression factor refers to density or diameter. But we have a reference. I went straight to the reference list to check reference number 9, but this took me back to the report on the Nuclear Weapons Archive. After a few hours reading details about the implosion design, I found the following sentence. When compressed by the implosion to over twice its original density, the pit became an assembly of some 3 to 4 critical masses. Pit is how weapon designers call the nuclear core. So here I finally found that the compression factor refers to the density and not the diameter. I later found this paper modeling the early moments of a nuclear explosion. It is a math-heavy article in which the author defines the compression factor to be the ratio between densities after and before the implosion, and then runs a simulation to determine the yield of the bomb. He finds that to match the yield of the Trinity test, this factor must be close to 2.5. So now I have two sources that indicate that the compression factor 2 to 3 refers to the plutonium density, not diameter. I could just stop here and let it go, but I wondered, could I calculate this in any other way? Without going into simulations, I decided to give it a try focusing on the plutonium compression. In the book, The Physics of the Manhattan Project, I found the following. The bulk modulus is a measure of the compressibility of the material which for plutonium can be taken to be 50 megapascals. With this information, I search for a relationship between density and bulk modulus. Now I have an equation. It is a differential equation. After rearranging terms, the equation takes this simple form, which can be easily integrated. If you are not familiar with this type of equations, I invite you to check the course Calculus in a Nutshell on Brilliant.org. Full disclosure, this video is not sponsored by Brilliant. I am recommending this course because I completed it the other day just for fun and it was great. The course includes a section on how to solve this exact type of equation. Also, you support the channel by using the link in the description and remember that for the first 30 days it's free. In this equation, row 1 is the density before the implosion and row 2 is the density after the implosion. Whereas on the right hand side, P1 and P2 refer to the pressures, before and after. P2 is the pressure produced by the explosives, which we expect to be orders of magnitudes higher than P1, so P1 can be just ignored. The pressure of the implosion shockwave by the high explosives, what we call P2, can be found on the Nuclear Weapons Archive. High-performance explosive can generate shockwave pressures of 400 kilobars, this is equivalent to 40 megapascals. And K, the bulk modulus, is what I found earlier, 50 megapascals. Plugging these values in our expression, we find the density ratio to be 2.23. Here is again the compression factor, which is in perfect agreement with the value found earlier, 2.5, possibly somewhat less. So now I'm very confident that the compression factor refers to the density, not the diameter, of the core, and now I can answer the original question. For this, we can convert the compression factor into the physical size of the plutonium core before and after the implosion. Density is mass divided by volume, so the density ratio becomes a ratio of diameters. Before the implosion, the diameter D1 was 91.7 millimeters. Solving for D2, after the implosion, the diameter becomes 70 millimeters, slightly over a tennis ball. 
So yes, Speckmesser, you would be able to see the difference in size of the plutonium core after the implosion. Of course, this takes place inside the bomb, which blows up in a few microseconds, so it cannot be literally seen. Moreover, I have not considered any details about the structure of plutonium, or even if it makes sense to talk about a solid sphere at these high temperatures and pressure. If you want to dig deeper, find below a link to this interesting article. Once again, thanks for the many questions. Feel free to use the comments below to add your questions for future videos in this series. If I don't know the answer, I will try to find experts for support. Also, let me know in the comments what topics you would like me to cover, even beyond nuclear weapons, and get your free dose of calculus while supporting the channel with the link below.